thank you for bearing with me, everybody. Uh, my name's Rachel Ford, for those of you who don't know me, and I work, my company is Verve Creative, and we are a marketing and design agency. So today we're going to talk about the rhythmical acquisition of So um, your entire existence as a business owner uh, lives and dies by how effective your sales and marketing is at producing revenue for you. And if you were marketing and you've got a sales system that brings you in new customers every day like clockwork, then owning a business is absolutely phenomenal. But if you don't, then owning a business makes life very unpredictable, unreliable and highly stressful. Because the destiny then of your company, of your income and your family is all dependent on whatever fate is dropping into your lap. So you can either ignore it, turn a blind eye, cross your fingers and hope that everything will work out fine. Or you can join the winning side by installing a marketing and sales system in your business and watch it, your business grow. So either way, you've got to understand that all of the latest shiny marketing tactics, hacks and tools aren't going to solve the problem of how do I get more customers? because more tactics aren't actually the answer. And you probably already know this deep down. Because if you're like most business owners, you've gone through countless CRM programs, software programs, landing page builders, all the latest sales funnel hacks, and you've actually had very little success. And the reason for this is because they all treat symptoms of lack of sales and they don't cure the systemic cause of the problem. And what you need is a system to bring your business leads, inquiries, and ultimately the buyers that you need. So I don't know whether anybody's seen this money pyramid before, which came from uh, Dan Kennedy, but he devised this pyramid to explain where most of the money is in small business owners. And if you look, 80% are in a pig a place of financial struggle or 20% of them are actually broke. And there's only 20% of business owners who are actually are currently earning a good living or only 1% who are actually rich. And most of those people in the bottom chunk, well, they're constantly worrying. Every month it's, oh, crikey, can I meet payroll? How am I going to pay my VAT bill? Do I need another credit card? Can I even pay myself? So what as a business owner you need to do is pay attention to those people at the top. Look at what they're doing. But actually, that's quite difficult to do. And you will only consistently move up that pyramid if you're implementing and actioning and doing stuff in your marketing. So by cracking the rhythmical acquisition of customers, you will move yourself up that pyramid. And it'll move you from a place of endless struggle to at least having a good living, if not a better living than you've got at the moment. But most business owners, they actually don't own a business. They own a job. And you've become a slave to your own business because you probably started off with great passion, with a freedom and a hunger for a better life. But somewhere along the journey, you've lost your way a bit. And your day probably starts with you waking up, checking your email, seeing what's come in overnight, seeing who's not coming into work that day. And then you get bogged down in the tactical hell of dealing with time sucky, sucking, busy activities that actually drain the life out of you. And they don't move your business forward because you're ending up working in your business all day long, not on your business. But how does that differ to someone who's owning a thriving, wildly successful business? Somebody who's constantly generating new leads, clients and revenue each and every week like clockwork. Truth is, they've probably got automated systems and possibly even a team in place running the daily operations and doing the grunt work of the business. But they're commanding higher prices, they're making more profits and they're growing. They're like the business superheroes. So if you think about it, what's the difference between a chef who starts a catering business and 20 years later, he realizes that basically he's created a job, not a business, 
and another chef who starts a catering business and in 10 years time's got 16 locations and then sells it for multi-million pounds. The difference isn't in the food, it's in the marketing and the selling of the food. And that's the same across all industries because the single most important rule is bus in business is that as the owner, your number one responsibility is to get and keep customers. And to do that, you need to make a fundamental mind shift because you've got to stop thinking of yourself as a doer of your thing, but start thinking of yourself as a marketer of your thing. And to get any form of rhythmic acquisition of customers, you need to have in place the rhythmic activity of marketing and you need to be doing it constantly and you need to be doing it consistently. And you always need to be keeping your mind open. So one of the key things you need to do is actually think about where are you now? Where is your business now? And where do you want to be? And what you've got to do is clearly identify that gap. And then you've got to know two absolutely key numbers and they must drive everything you do. And those key numbers, which when I speak to a lot of businesses, most people cannot answer the question. Do you know what does it cost you to acquire a customer and how much is that customer worth to you? Then you need to set yourself really crystal clear goals. And those goals aren't based on how will it make my life easier? But those goals need to be based on where do I really want to be to have my perfect ideal life? So think about what your ideal life could be could be like and what's stopping you from getting there. And actually, probably the reason most people never reach those ideal goals is that they never actually define them. And then you've got to transpose that ideal life onto your business. And to do that properly and to get traction, you've got to know your numbers. So say you've done this exercise and you've worked out that you, your business needs to be turning over £200,000 per annum to give you your perfect life. And you know that you operate at a 20% net margin. So that means you'd need a £1 million turnover to get that life. An average customer spends £500 a month with you. So you'd need 166 customers to get that million pounds. But you've already got 66 customers. So really, you just need 100 more customers. So then knowing your numbers, you need to know what would happen for me to get two new customers per week? Because that's all it boils down to. You know that you can convert 50% of the people that you talk to on a face-to-face -face basis. So to get two customers, you're only going to need four meetings. And you know to get four meetings, well, you convert 50% of your leads into prospects. So you're only going to need eight inquiries to get you those four meetings, to get you those two customers, to get you that £200 per annum profit. So once you work it out and divide, divide it down into little chunks like that, firstly, you know what you're aiming for. But secondly, it suddenly becomes a bit more manageable in your head. Because if you know you only need eight inquiries, and you know that that's going to get you £200,000 per annum, that becomes a much easier goal to go for. But then you need to sense check it. So have you got the capacity to do it? Have you got the marketing in place to do it? Who's going to sell it? How are they going to sell it? And is it even possible? So once you know your numbers, my little mantra is marketing equals creativity plus maths. And this is where the marketing then comes in. So going back to knowing your numbers, you need to know, be knowing things. How much money did you make in the last 12 months? How many customers did you add this year? Are your targets realistic? What's your break even, your gross margin? Are you a busy fool? How much should you be spending to get a customer? What's your current marketing cost per lead? What's your current cost per sale by every marketing pillar you do? And then those overriding ones, what does it cost you to get a customer and how much is that customer worth? 
because remember remember rhythmic activity is always going to come before rhythmic acquisition so why am i've got a suitcase up here do we remember those days before coronavirus when we could travel and we could stay away so just think about it if you're going to go on a business trip away for the night or if you're going to go for a weekend away with the girls or a weekend away with the boys if you're going to go on a skiing holiday or a family holiday to Disney, there are always going to be certain things that you're going to take with you, irrespective of where you're going and for how long that is. And those are going to be things like your pants, your socks, your charger and your toiletries. So one of the key things that I go through with my clients are looking at their marketing and looking at their, their marketing assets that are the foundation blocks of everything they do. And those foundation blocks are effectively your pants, your socks, your toiletries, and your charges of marketing. So as I was a bit late, I'm gonna rattle through these, but I'm going to go through, I've got 11 foundation blocks. I'm not gonna go through all of them, don't worry. I'm just going to go through some of them now, because once you've got these things in place, then you can really go on to try and build your business. So the first thing you need to do is have a complete and utter review of every piece of marketing collateral that you produce. Have a quality test on it. So make sure all of your marketing has a crystal clear objective. Does it tell your customers what you want them to do at the end of it? It could be buy something, it could be call you, it could be go to your website, but is that objective clear? Is it boring or is it fun? Is it interesting? Make it so it grabs people's attention. Clearly position yourself, make it personable and relatable. Nowadays, particularly over the last few months, use video. Video is huge at the moment. Make sure your marketing shows any awards, accreditations. Websites need to link to review sites. Use your customer testimonials. Have a really, really strong offer on there and multiple calls to action. You can't have enough of these. On a website, I always say it's four or maybe more. I'd also suggest you get a hold of this book, which I read recently, because I heard of it um, from a chap called Phil Coleman, and I'll tell you about him in a minute. It's a book called They Ask You Answer, as you can see by Marcus Sheridan. And he talks about all the things that you should blog about on your website. You should no longer call it a blog, call it a knowledge center. And use that as an opportunity to answer the questions that your customers ask of you. And you probably know yourself, if ever you're going to see a client or if ever you're quoting for something, mm -hmm. there'll probably be a set number of questions that your customers always ask you. If you're an accountant, it could be things like, how often do we have a meeting? Um, if you're an electrician, it could be what are the best sort of lights to have in a lounge or a kitchen or a bathroom? Think of the questions people ask you and then generate a blog around that. It could be about pricing, it could be about costs, it could be about problems your customers face. You could do reviews, you could do verses and comparisons, but you need to be thinking about the questions that your customers ask you and those are the sorts of things you need to put you put on your website. To show you how powerful this is, this chap, Phil Coleman, that I spoke to you about just before, he owns a company called Barlow Blinds in Leicester. One Christmas, he sat down and he wrote 50 articles based on the questions that his customers asked him about blinds. Within three months, his website traffic went up from 400 to 27,000 visitors every month. Go and have a look at his website. It's well worth seeing how he put everything in place. The other thing that's a foundation block is Google My Business. At the moment, 80% of small businesses don't have a Google My Business presence. It is free. Why you aren't using it, I have got no idea. If you know, if you could do a Google search, the Google My Business is the bit that appears in the right hand column or the bit that plops you on the map that appears on the Google search box. So easy to set up, so easy to use, and it actually really helps you on Google in searches and being found. 
I've got a Google My Business checklist if anybody would like it after this. I'll whiz it over to you. But some of the things to, re to know to optimize your Google My Business profile, if you're putting pictures on there, Google loves people, put people on there. When you put your pictures on there, make sure you name your pictures by your keywords, because as much as Google is clever, it can't tell what a photo is. But if the photo is named by a keyword, it's more likely to, to um, show up. Use the post feature. Put up a new post every week. The more frequently you're using Google My Business, the, rank, the higher your rank. And also check on all your settings on your mobile or on your um, iPad, because there are different settings available for Google My Business on, on tablets and mobiles than there are on a computer. So it's well worth having a look at both of those. The next thing you need to make sure you've got in place is a systemized review collection. So why don't your customers leave you lots of reviews online? Could it be because they don't think to do so? Is it because they forget to do so? Is it because they don't know where or how to do so? The answer is probably because it's you, you never ask them to do it. And it only takes a quick email after um, you've done some work for somebody with a link to any of your uh, and just ask them to give you a review. And do you know what? Most people will do it. And power that you can then use those reviews in all sorts of different places on your social media, on your website, even in emails. And they're really, really powerful testimonials. And people look at reviews and make decisions about reviews. And don't worry if you get a bad review, because responding to a bad review and the way you respond to it can be as powerful as a good review. Another thing that I suggest, and this is probably more relevant to uh, people who run a trade, so electricians, plumbers, things like that, are to use neighborhood cards. So these are printed cards. This is one, for instance, that's been done for a mobile mechanic. This is one that's been done for an electrician. So if you're working at somebody's house, this one, the yellow dot, when you've finished working there, post these cards through the houses five to the left, five to the right, and 10 in front of you. And they really work to help build your profile and get you more business. And there was actually a chap that I was talking to, Jeff Ford, who owns a property, property company in Plymouth, who did this three weeks ago. And remember, we're in lockdown. And just by doing that, he got a £4,000 roofing job just from posting out 20 cards. Now, I appreciate it's different if you're a consultant or something like that, or a coach, or if you're an accountant, it's not so easy to do. But then you could do a similar thing, and I call it a, a Nanny McPhee card. So Nanny McPhee was all about uh, when you need me. So do a card based on that. Send it to customers that have worked with you. And if they don't need you now, ask them to pass it on to somebody who might. Really simple, really easy to do. LinkedIn, make sure you're on LinkedIn. And that's for B2C as well as B2C. Sort your profile out. Make sure you're to not talking about I's and we's. People don't want to read about you. They want to read about themselves. Make your profile talk to your ideal customer. Relate to their problems. Tell, you how, tell them how you solve their problems. And you need to uh, map a campaign on LinkedIn, regularly, consistently use LinkedIn, change it up, do articles, do videos, do posts, comment, adjust your messaging, address the elephant in the room at the moment, talk about how things are different because of the situation we're in, but don't let the current situation stop you from using LinkedIn. The other thing you need to have in place, and this is one of almost my final one for today, and it goes back to knowing your numbers. Everybody needs a really forensic marketing tracker in place. I've tried to make this as readable as possible, and I've only taken some of it. But you need to be map mapping every day the results of every piece of marketing that you're doing. So be it Google Ads be it LinkedIn, be it Instagram, YouTube, if you're doing leaflet drops, if you're doing networking, every day put in how many leads you're getting from each of your marketing pillars. 
<clears throat> how many proposals that's generating, how many new clients, how many sales, what's the value of them. And then, as you can see at the bottom, how much are you spending on it? What's it costing you to get a lead? And what's it costing you to get a sale? And I'll tell you what, so many people don't do this. And interestingly, I would reckon if you did this, you might be very surprised as to what is the most profitable and successful marketing pillar for you. So have a go at it. I'm happy to send this over to anybody who wants it, but really track it really forensically. And then you will be able to see where you should be putting more money and where you should be spending less money, because it's all about optimizing what you're doing and doing the best things most effectively. Have you got a follow-up system in place? Most people don't follow up, or they might follow up once or twice, but actually follow up, follow up, follow up. Some people won't even respond to you until you've touched them over 21 times. So just keep going, but have a system. Don't have an ad hoc process. This is a system that I use with my clients. So we map the whole process out from when you get a new lead, how many times you call them, what happens if they don't respond, what route do you go down, mix up how you're contacting them. It could be phone calls, it can be texts. You can send a video in an email, you can send a straightforward email. Then what happens when you do have a conversation with them? Do you get an appointment? Do you not get an appointment? Then you go into a different follow-up route. Have it all planned, have it all mapped out. But make sure you go back to customers in a timely fashion and in a pleasant fashion. Don't expect them to keep calling you. I couldn't believe it how many times I've filled in lead forms on, on an internet, on a website, and I get an out of office response to it. But then nobody comes back to me. They expect me to go to them. Follow up every single lead that you get. I think I'm probably coming to the end of my time. So we all realize the next few months are gonna be hard. They're not gonna be easy. We're all working in a completely new situation, but don't do it alone. And that's me done. Thank you very much. <laughs>